Hey guys, welcome to this instructional on taking the back. My name is Rory Van Fleet. This is my training partner, Kevin Wong. This is a continuation of my previous instructionals, back control basics and advanced back control. I want you guys to understand how to control the back first, how to be able to reset it, how to be able to transition, how to be able to submit people before you bother working on how to enter the position because if you put all that work in to get to the position and then you're just gonna lose it every time, it becomes a wasted effort and it can become very discouraging. So please go through that stuff. I'm gonna teach as if you already understand some of those concepts and principles. And we're gonna be jumping into how to take the back. Okay guys, so if you've gone through my previous instructionals, you already know about chest to back connection, but that is ultimately what we need every time to be able to control the back. If I cannot attach myself to the space behind Kevin's shoulders with my chest, then I'm unable to secure back control. And so when it comes to taking the back, we need to find that back exposure. The problem is, is that if we're in a position like side control, right now, Kevin's back is connected to the ground. And so it's very difficult for me to be able to get there. We will go over two different ways that we can utilize lever-based rotational control to turn our opponent away, to be able to expose that space. But for right now, at least looking at the, the basic movements, we're gonna be looking at how we are just gonna to have to take opportunities when they come up. And so for us, it's gonna be either our opponent turns away from us, in which then their back becomes exposed. Now we're gonna to look to attach ourselves to this, or our opponent turns into us like they should, and this is gonna be more difficult, but you can see how now this space has been opened, and so this is how we're gonna be working to try and get in. If Kevin lays this way with his head paint, uh, facing to the camera, turn up onto your side, what we need to be able to do is keep our opponent from being able to hide their back. There is a lever from Kevin's shoulder to his shoulder. The distance up here to the very, uh, very top is gonna to be the top of the lever where I'm gonna be able to apply more force to stop him from being able to go down to his back. The drill that I kinda of just want you guys to think about is right here. If I push into the mid of Kevin's back, I'm not anywhere near the end of the lever and if he rolls back to put his back to the floor, he just collapses my hand. I can't stop him. I need to be up here, up in his shoulder. Now, if I drive force into him like this and he tries to put his back to the mat, it's very difficult to. There's two ways that he puts his back to the mat. One, he brings his shoulder, his top shoulder down like this, or he brings his bottom shoulder away from me like that. We need to be able to connect ourselves. So I'm never gonna try and do something like that where I was just showing with my hand trying to hold him back. But what we're gonna look to do is take our chest and connect it to him. We're gonna bring our seatbelt grip, so our arm is gonna come underneath his. Our left arm is gonna come over top and we're gonna hide the killing hand. We're gonna have our hands clasped together with a, a grip here where my hand is coming over top, no thumbs, gripping over top of my knuckles. And I'm closing my hands here to hide my fingers so that he doesn't have access to them. And I'm just forming it at the center of his chest. This allows me to control the shoulder that we need for the top of the lever. And I have control of his neck. If I'm on my knees, then I'm going to be able, I'm not going to be generating as much force. So we want live toes. I want you guys off your knees so that all my weight is traveling into my partner rather than useless, uselessly transferring into the ground. From here, I keep my chin tight to his shoulder. You can be on your knees at first if you want to kind of do a bit lighter, but ultimately if we are going up against a resisting opponent, driving on our feet is going to be the best way to maximize force. So that now if Kevin tries to turn back into me, he can't. And if he tries to turn and get that shoulder away from me, he still can't. What we don't want is for someone to expose their back, we move to control it, and then he turns back into us and we lose this. It's gonna happen, obviously, especially as we're developing, but especially as we go against better guys that are better at defending the positions. And we'll shut down our abilities to take their back, no matter what, because it's very hard to come back from it from a points perspective, if it's competition, but also in a fight, back control is the best position we can have. And so no one wants to allow that to happen. So your opponent turns away from you. I want you guys to connect your chest. I want you guys to connect your hands here. Control that shoulder. I like to post up on one leg and have one knee down, just as kind of like a middle ground. And then I'm pulling in and driving my chest forward. I can almost start to try and think about 
facing Kevin's face down into the mat. Very difficult for him to do stuff from here. Try and turn back in. Like I talked about in the back control basics, our seat belt that we're using to control our opponent's upper body with direct rotational control is our primary form of control. Hooks are secondary. Hooks are nice, they help. They also get us points in competition, but they're not necessary to be able to actually control the back. The main thing is that chest to back connection with the seat belt. So if I can attach my chest to Kevin's back and hold it and stop him from being able to easily get him his back to the floor or to turn away from me, then I'm gonna be successful and I'm gonna make everything really difficult for him. And then I'm gonna be able to later set up my submissions or putting my hooks into a uh, finish take in the back. So this is something I kind of do quite frequently as like a warm up when I'm teaching any kind of back control class when we're taking the back is having my students practice this where your opponent just turns away your training partner and you look to just connect to their back and stop them from being able to turn back in. So spend some time with this. It's going to tie into the next technique that we're going to go over, which is the chair sit. Okay, so the first few techniques that we're going to look at taking the back are going to be from top control and they're very basic movements that we need to know to be able to one be effective at taking the back but also chain our uh, attacks that we're able to threaten submissions and back attacks if we try and look for just one path to the back then we're never going to find success with it and so the first technique we're going to look at is the chair sit which is one of the most traditional ways of taking the back we're just going to do this from side control what i'm going to do is a very the same thing we were just doing where our opponent turns away from us so whether we were able to create a, the movement ourselves by using something to turn our opponent away, or they turned away for us, usually because our opponent, like our opponent's never going to try and be with their back facing us, but ultimately Kevin is going to be turning away to turn up in the turtle. And if he can turn up in the turtle, he has now generated pretty good base, pretty good alignment because he's got posture, structure, and base, and now he's going to be able to sit down and face back towards me. And if this happens, then I've lost everything. So we're going to be taking the back as they're going on that path to turtle. As Kevin turns away, this is my configuration. This arm should already be behind his head because I should be looking for a cross face. This arm is already going to be down at his hips. And so as he turns away, it's very easy for me to form the seat belt here where once again, this arm shoots underneath his armpit and connects over top of the killing hand, the hand that's going to be the one threatening the choke. And I bring my chin up over top of my shoulder or over his shoulder. What I'm looking at doing is driving. I'm just on my knees right now for the demonstration purposes, but otherwise I'd be on my feet, really trying to flatten them out. Just like how Kevin is posting his hand on the mat right now, it's not uncommon for guys to do this. That can be our opportunity to so just start going straight for chokes because his hand is already occupied trying to generate base. From here, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna keep driving into Kevin I'm going to lift my hips so my knees come off the mat. My elbow is on the floor right now with my killing hand so I have base. And I'm going to bring my left knee up to my elbow. Here, like this behind his back. What I'm going to do is I'm going to sit down to my hip, keeping my head super tight. Anytime I create any space here, Kevin's going to be able to turn back into me. By sitting on my hip as well, is that I start to turn my body to the side so I'm not going to need the flexibility to bring this leg over. What a lot of people do is they sit up on their knees still and then they're leaning forward, it's uncomfortable, and then they're trying to throw their leg over. Where if you just sit down to create a little more, uh, yourself a little more parallel to your opponent's body, now, much easier for me to throw my leg over. My leg comes over, heel to the mat, and I suck my heel into my opponent's hips. What I want to try to avoid, it's not the end of the world, but I don't want this to happen. This is just ultimately going to be a hook if I pull him into back control successfully, but he's that much closer to getting me into deep half guard. And so from here, if he's able to start turning into me just even slightly or walking his hips away from me, then he's going to be able to start pulling himself underneath and I'm in a half guard. Where if I am over top with my foot here, it's harder for him to walk his hip away. And even if he turns into me slightly, we're transferring back to mount, which I went over in back control basics. So from here, let me back up a little bit. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna bring my elbow up onto my knee so that I can prop myself up higher. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna generate some base off of the ground here, and I'm gonna generate some base with my elbow and with my knee 
pushing sideways basically into the ground with my thigh. Just a light push so that I'm going to be able to pull them up. Mistake, once again, is lifting up like this and having your opponent turn into you. Keep your chest glued to their back, your head right next to theirs, and you're going to lift them up and push yourself to the far side. We're going to end up on weak side back control where I'm on the side with the motor cycle grip or the underhooking side. And so from there, we can either play from this position or we adjust ourselves and like I talked about in back control, adjusting back to the strong side. This is why it's really important that you guys understand already how to control the back because we're going to need to make adjustments. The ways that we, we don't get to choose usually how we enter the back control. And so depending on what side we're attacking from, we're going to necessarily end up on the weak side or the strong side against our choosing. And we're going to have to make changes once we're there. You have back control, so you control the position and so you can make those changes with relative ease. So here, so here Kevin turns away, back is exposed. I occupy that space. From here, I start getting off my knees so that I can drive and the goal should be that I can keep Kevin driven over like this. So try and turn into me, Kevin. Try and turn in. I can walk my knee up while I'm still continuing that force. I should never at some point go, okay, I'm gonna bring my knee up and then take away all tension and then have him turn into me. I'm here trying to flatten him out. My elbow is in base and I bring my knee up to my elbow. I sit down on my hip. From here, I bring my knee up I'm going to look to bring my knee over top at this point, leaning to the side even a little bit more if I need to. So if you feel like you can't, from here, I lean, throw the leg over. Now from here, my leg is going to be flusher along the ground here. What I'm going to be kind of doing is a little bit of a, uh, a winging butterfly motion where I'm pushing off like this. So I'm going to be able to generate some base and move my upper body. I'm doing this as well with my elbow. So as I'm here, I'm going to migrate my elbow to the top of my knee, so I naturally gain more range. And from here, I'm just going to be creating like a slight pull on top of me, so that then I can move over from my right butt cheek to my left butt cheek. So from here, like this. So there's just a little push. This isn't a strong alignment for me to be able to push with my leg, but I don't need very much strength to do this. So here, pushing, keeping myself super connected, not taking myself away. To rotate to this side. I can look to body triangle immediately if you have the length. Otherwise, we're here. I like attacking the weak side, so I move to these attacks. Otherwise, establish the hooks, bring your leg out, adjust the hip angle, build up onto your elbow, so that now you're going to be in proper base to, stack, uh, to attack from the strong side. So, chair sit is a classic move. You absolutely need to be able to do it from side control as well as the mount, which we're going to do kind of talk about a little bit next as well as some problems that we run into when our opponent has really strong knee elbow connection. Okay, so nothing changes when we're doing it from mount, but I just want to show it to you guys just for a bit of context as well as showing you how we deal with somebody when they're keeping stronger knee elbow connection. So, a bit more. so here in mount, Kevin has his shoulders glued to the mat. I cannot take his back right now. The floor is occupying that space. I can't magically phase through the ground. Kevin is going to turn onto his side. Now, if he does the proper mount escape stuff, like I had talked about in the mount escape instruction, when he keeps his elbow glued to my hip, this is not the time. But if I can either get this elbow off across my center line, so there's nothing stopping me from being able to get to his back, or out of desperation he turns, then I'm going to be able to start accessing this space. So I recognize first that there's exposure. Now I'm going to look to connect myself to it. What I'm going to do is I'm going to bring this arm underneath so that I can start to bring my chest over behind his back and I can start to connect myself here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to bring my knee up behind his back while I pivot myself into like a technical mount. So as I'm here, I'm sliding up so I can lower myself and get my chest behind him. Here, as he turns, and I'm connecting myself. So I'm immediately right back here into this chair sit position. As soon as Kevin turns, I, if I need to, I can plant my hands into the mat to make myself lighter so I can lift my hips and I'm going to slide myself up and down. Now the only problem with this is that I un, I'm unable to really secure chest to back connection first. I kind of have to move my hips here. 
And so from here, my goal is to start establishing control immediately. If he starts to turn into me too quickly and I don't know I'm unable to, then just recognize you lost a range battle and go back to mount. So as he turns here, controlling, exact same, pull yourself to the side. Now the good thing about mount is you're already straddling your opponent, so you already will have that leg over. If I'm here and Kevin's keeping the elbow connection and I've sat down, I'm going to have a little bit more difficult time throwing my leg over like this. What I want to do is I want to control here. I'm going to look to fall further to the side here and start opening up my elbow to be able to open up his elbow. And what I'm going to look to do is instead of throwing the hook in, I'm just going to look to bring my leg on top of his thigh. And now here, keep a nice knee elbow connection, Kevin. I'm just going to push his leg down and then slide it in. I don't need to push his leg, exaggerate all the way down here. All I need is a little bit of space for my leg. So, Connects the elbow connection, hold it nice and tight. Instead of just trying to throw the leg over here, keep the knee elbow connection. I lean further back, I put my leg here. Then I can slide it in. Whether I go here, which I prefer not to because of half guard, or I bring it here. But ultimately, here, hook my leg on. It just becomes a hook for the back once we're on the other side. So it's not the end of the world. You just have to move quickly. As long as you have just the back connection, it's going to be impossible for your opponent to turn back into face you to actually create that half guard. So we can do it from the mount. And if your opponent is keeping the elbow connection, which a good guy will because they do not want to allow you to get that hook, you're just going to look to, instead of staying a little more upright, lean even further so that then you're going to be able to bring this leg up and push down on the top of their thigh to insert that hook. Next move we're going to look at is inserting the low hook. Our opponent has managed to turn away from us a little too much. Now, we might already have chest to back connection, which is fantastic. Then it doesn't ultimately matter. This is just another way that we're able to take the back when the chair sit doesn't make too much sense anymore. So, our opponent is starting to turn towards turtle. At some point, as Kevin uh, turned to face me, if Kevin looks to continue turning towards turtle, right now his hip is flush to the mat. Turn up in the turtle, Kevin. What did his hip do? His hip lifted. And what happens when his hip lifts is that there becomes space right here. And what we're going to do is fire a hook through to the bottom. So with the chair set, we were looking to throw our leg over top and start forming a top hook or a hook at least all the way across our opponent's hip, barring and controlling the hips. But in this case, because our opponent starts turning away, it doesn't make sense for me at this point to try and throw my leg over. So if I have seatbelt connection and Kevin's turning away from me and I'm trying to do this, I might end up just kind of riding up on the turtle and then uh, I end up falling off to the side. Chair sit works when our opponent, uh, when their hips are still flat on the ground. From here, as his, he starts to move, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to bring my knee up over top and I'm just going to rest the inside of my thigh or my shin on his hip here. All I'm looking to do is just be able to catch a ride. So as Kevin continues to move, I'm able to now fire that hook through. And now from here, I'm gonna cross my ankles. Now, if you guys watch the instructional, and if you guys have, or if you're watching this, you have access to it, go over the Popovich, where if he's keeping the elbow connection, I'm able to utilize this uh, connection here at his hips and his upper body to be able to open them up to fire that hook in. Big mistake that people make with this is that instead of staying super close to your opponent's hips and using their momentum to your advantage to ride with them, they try and create some space and just use dexterity, flexibility to try and throw their leg in. And the risk is, is that you end up just driving your foot into the mat with your knee in a compromised angle and you end up hurting yourself. So the way of doing this to make it much easier for yourself is to ride with. So as I'm here, I'm laying down on my side and I'm just putting my leg on top of Kevin here. So no matter what, as he starts to move, he lifts. Now see how that hip lifts? As soon as that happens, I ride with them, and as that happens, I bring my knee up, and I fire it through. He might already get to a turtle position. I'm not, it's not the end of the world. From here, I'm going to be able to just control and look to pull him out of base to go back to the back, which we'll cover a bit in the next video, but we're just waiting for our opponent to lift the hips so we can fire this in. Here. 
Once I got that little hook in, then this leg can either be a butterfly hook kind of controlling, or I'm gonna look to bring it over top, or across my ankles, and then look to do the Popovich to be able to secure back control. So, just another tool. You don't actually ever really have to use this one, but it's obviously gonna make your back taking game more dynamic. There's multiple ways of scanning the cat in a lot of these situations, but this is just another tool to make you guys more effective. So this video, our opponent has managed to turn even further away, getting even closer to turtle. I'm avoiding going over taking, attacking the turtle position. I'd rather do an entire instructional on that because it's a very complex position to attack our opponent's in very strong alignment. The goal though, is to try and stop our opponent from securing a strong alignment in turtle position. And so if Kevin is turning away from me and he turns the turtle and he gets the turtle and he connects his knees and his elbows to his body and he becomes this strong shell, he's got posture, he's got strong structure in the elbow connection and he's even got base. Whether he's dead toes or live toes, he still has the ability to mobilize his hips to turn freely to his left or to his right. Real pain in the ass for me to deal with. We were looking for the low hook whether because we just uh, kind of lapsed on it and wasn't able to be successful getting it or we don't like the technique, our opponent gets a little bit further. And so now we're gonna be looking at attacking with a lever-based control of our opponent's ankle to be able to internally rotate and bring their hip back towards us. So we'll go from kind of three five here. So Kevin's on his side. He's gotta turn away from me to be able to build up and neutralize what we've been working on. So as I'm here and I've got this control and Kevin's starting to turn away from me, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna bring my knee up and have it on top of his thigh. So I'm looking to jam this into that space. Instead of putting my entire leg through with a low hook like this, I just put my knee here. It's much easier to do. I'm using a shorter frame. It doesn't take anywhere near as, dex uh, as much dexterity or preparation. What I'm looking to do here, whether he's already internal or not, he hasn't established very good alignment because I was able to create this wedge first. My leg is going to hook over top and we're going to control this ankle. What I'm looking at doing is causing internal rotation to his hip to see how that takes his hip over. So even if I didn't control his upper body at all, I'm checking his knee so his knee is unable to move to absorb this force and I'm controlling this foot. As I create this internal rotation, it brings my opponent's hips back towards me and I insert that hook. If I do not check this knee, and I just try flaring his leg, then his knee can just move to the side, he can adjust his hip angle, or he just moves his knee further out like this to be able to alleviate that force. So let's turn more this way, on your side again. So here, Kevin's turning away. There's still gonna be this space when his hip lifts. What I'm gonna do from here is I'm just going to bring my knee here. So see how now my knee starts to rest on top of his thigh down at his knee. If he tries to connect his knee and his elbow right now, it's impossible to do effectively because my knee is already here. If he connects his knees and elbow, well now I can't really do anything from here. Now he's got strong alignment. My ability to actually access his ankle as well is very difficult because his butt is going to be right above his heel. I don't have the space. The goal is as he turns into this position, keep turning. Look how far away his butt is from his foot, and my knee is already here. This is what's going to allow me to get that control. And I want to do all that while I'm keeping chest to back connection. So, on your side again. So, as I'm here and he's turning away, my knee comes on top, my foot immediately reaches and hooks down at his ankle. Instead of flaring my toes out like this, this becomes pretty weak, takes a bit of flexibility in my leg. I'm looking at just having my knee turned into towards his butt as like a kickstand, so that if he tries to bring his butt over top of his foot, he can't. I've wedged it, but if, he, if I'm like this and he can sit down, it's going to be more difficult if he lowers the center of gravity. I'm here, and now with my leg curl, I'm able to hook his leg, and this is a strong alignment. This is a strong motion. This is not. So from here, I curl him, I start to pull him on top, so now see how his knee starts to lift off the mat? This allows me to kick my foot through and insert that low hook. Now same thing applies, I can just go right to like the Popovich. If he hasn't connected his knee elbow connection, I can just throw that leg over top. It's always going to be kind of dependent on what your opponent's alignment is, your side facing camera. So now that I've got some of that footwork out of the way, 
As I'm here, he turns my knee right there wedged on top. I hook his ankle, I bend it, the knee starts to lift, so now I can kick my leg through. Leg inserts as a hook. I throw this leg over top. If I'm on the strong side, which I would be here, I build back up to my elbow, then I can look to start going through my back control and attacking the rear naked choke. So don't allow your opponent to get to really strong turtle and form that strong alignment, that like turtle shell where it's gonna make it really difficult to attack them. Look to compromise their structure on the way that they're getting there so that they're never able to form a strong knee elbow connection and it's gonna be so much easier to attack the back. All right, so the next move is Kevin's favorite, my least favorite, only in the sense that it takes a lot of effort to use. The spin behind is when our opponent turns in to face us, which all opponents are going to because they want to face us so that they can face all their weapons towards us. Nobody wants to willingly give up their back. So this is where we're going to be more realistically having to fight from against better guys, where our opponent has exposed their back, but they've exposed it in a way that's safe because they're here blocking us. So especially side control, he's got to block the cross face, he's turned towards us. But what has happened? There is space here. But how the hell do we get there? I can't perform a chair sit, I can't perform any of those moves yet until I get to this side. And so what we're going to look to do is perform the spin behind. Here, I'll just, uh, just go this way. The spin behind, slide down. What I want to do is I want to spin around my opponent, upwards around the head. What I'm going to do first is I need to break their alignment. So Kevin can be blocking here. This is going to be kind of difficult, but especially against like somebody who's kind of balled up, not doing as much, or especially you see this against like the underhook here. He's blocking me on one side. He's going to come up to my back. What I'm going to look to do is take my hand, frame it down at his hip. I'm going to take my hand and I'm going to frame it at the crown of his head. So I push his head down. See right now he's in good, uh, good posture. At the top of the head, I push him down. He's in weak posture. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to first back myself away. I'm going to back myself away up at a 45 degree angle here. So that even if nothing else happened, if Kevin came up trying to finish a, that underhook or that single leg, one, it's difficult for him to come up because I'm framing his hip, so it's hard for him to lift it. And I'm framing his head, breaking his posture. At this point, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look to have this knee up. And I'm going to be down on this knee if I want to. And I'm going to look to step my leg behind my opponent's head enough that I can drop my knee behind their shoulder. So as I go here, I'm going to drop my knee behind the shoulder. As I do that, this knee's going to lift. I'm going to turn my hips and I'm going to bring this arm across his body. Here, I'm pivoting all the way around, dropping down onto my hip. This knee lands in base. This foot lands in base with my knee pointing up. So I'm able to generate force this way because what happens as soon as we turn around, spin around behind our opponent's back, Kevin's going to start immediately turning in to face me. And now everything's lost. I may have still protected myself, like if he had an underhook at first, this is still a better position for me. But as I've landed here, just like we did in the very first video of trying to maintain this back exposure, I'm going to drop my head down behind his shoulder. I'm going to start forming this seatbelt connection because now my arm is underneath, connecting at the chest, and here driving and lifting my hips off the mat. If I just keep my hips in the mat right now and he turns into me, it's very difficult for me to control. Here, driving in. Now, from here, going straight into the chair sit, straight into the low hook, whatever it is, because we've turned ourselves now onto the side that we need to be to be able to attack the back. So here, Kevin is in position. I'm going to back away, framing at the hip and the head, and backing away here, creating space. This is something that a lot of people don't do, and that's why they have a very hard time doing this. I now step behind his head and I'm going to drop my knee behind him here. As this knee drops, my other leg lifts so that I'm able to start creating movement in my hips here. My knee is dropped down behind his shoulder so that that's already creating a little bit of that wedge there so that if I was here and he's trying to turn back into me a little bit, it's at least a little bit more difficult. It's not going to hold him, but it's just little checks along the way. This arm comes across bringing my elbow to across his body. This is great for just finishing into side control, but what I'm looking to do is start forming the seatbelt control. I now pivot this leg through, and I sit down to my hip with my knee up, so now I can start driving into him, putting force into this top shoulder at the end of the lever, 
So if he tries to turn into me, he can't. That's something so important. Anytime you perform a spin behind, spin around, hold it, have your drilling partner just give you a little bit of resistance trying to push back after you've secured the position just to make sure that you're not just going to have your opponent get their back to the floor and then have them side control. So uh, if Kevin just moves over for a sec, what I'm looking at doing is checking my opponent's hip, head, post it up on my foot. This is just good for stopping the wrestling shot of them trying to come up, taking that single leg or the underhook. I'm stepping my leg up, I'm going to drop my knee and pivot up on top of my other leg as I throw the arm over and then I'm pivoting. So I'm using this knee as a pivot here to be able to rotate on it and move on to my hip. So you see guys doing solo movements sometimes warming up. I need to be able to step and rotate over onto my hip. As I'm here, I'm stepping, rotating onto my knee, rotating onto my hip to perform that spin behind. One more time. This is a very complicated movement. It's not easy to get good at. Here, Kevin turns into me, stop him, spin around, pull him. We gotta do this one really quickly because it's not something that we can do slowly. We have a lot of distance to cover. Kevin turns into me, I block, turn. And all these motions, I can start chaining together quite quickly to create a dynamic movement where I'm going to be able to just flurry my opponent with techniques and just like that where I'm able to start sinking in the choke while I'm doing all this back take stuff. So practice to spin behind. It's a super important movement to know. I hate it. It takes a lot of effort, but it's really effective. So put the time in and I think you're going to find a lot of success with it. So the main movements we've looked at so far are all relating to our opponent creating back exposure themselves. They're desperate, they need to try and escape a bad position. When you're trying to escape a bad position, you don't have a lot of options. This is sometimes you gotta take risks. And those are risks that we can capitalize on it. Sometimes though, and preferably, we wanna be able to actually force the movements ourselves. The only way we can do that is with lever-based rotational control, which I talked about in the back control instructionals. The main easiest way for us to first look at this is the cross face. Direct rotational control is where I just connect myself to my opponent and they cannot spin independ independently for myself. So if I control my chest to Kevin's chest, if Kevin tries to turn left or right, it's very difficult. But if I try and push into him, well, I can't really turn him. All I'm going to do is kind of slide around his chest. What I need is a lever. And so lever-based rotational control would allow me to make this movement. So instead of pushing on his chest, pushing on his shoulder where it's all braced against the ground, if I took his chin and I started pushing his chin and I kept driving his chin, what starts to happen? He starts to rotate with it because he doesn't like it and now his back becomes exposed. What we're going to do is look at the cross face to do that. Having a good cross face is so important. My arm, that's at top and side control, is coming underneath and I'm clubbing his face with my bicep and with my shoulder. My arm is reaching underneath and grabbing into his armpit. So I'm looking to grab down on his lat, basically connecting my fingers over and into his armpit as deep as I can go. What I'm going to look to do is I'm going to look to walk myself up at roughly a 45 degree angle. I'm going to lower my shoulder because the goal is to have my shoulder accessing his chin as a lever. This arm can just be checking the hip, checking the legs, kind of be doing whatever it wants. It's multi-purpose. From here, I'm not on my knees because if I'm on my knees, weight is transferring into the ground. I'm going to come up onto this foot. I'm trying to be really light right now so I'm not just crushing Kevin the whole time. And I'm going to turn my hips up like this and I'm stacking my shoulders on top of each other. If I'm like this, I have weight going through equally in parts through one shoulder, through my chest, neck, and to my other shoulder. So weight is spread out across Kevin right now. If I want to make all this force uh, more effective, more force with pounds per square inch, then I rotate myself like this. And so now the weight is transferring through my top shoulder down to my bottom shoulder. Now as I lift my hips up, you're going to be able to actually choke your opponent because our shoulder is going to be occluding the arteries on their neck. Some people will just eat a cross face, in which then we're going to be able to move to mount, we're going to be able to look at submissions because we're breaking their posture, we've broken their alignment, we can now move forward in the offensive cycle. Or, 
our opponent is going to hate it and they're gonna look to turn away from us. And so what we're, that's the main goal that we're looking to try to do here is control this, driving into our opponents and then they start to turn up. I wanna let them. If I keep my chest on top of this shoulder, he can never turn up. So as he tries to turn, I'm gonna back up a little bit and slide my chest behind his shoulder. So now we're in the same spot that we've always been in for back exposure. I connect the seatbelt and now we can start looking at the chair sit. Chair sit's always usually just option number one for us. Uh, one more time. So as I'm here, I've connected my cross face. I have my underhook. I'm gonna have to take this underhook away because right now I'm blocking over top of his body. I can't take his back like this. I'm looking at breaking the posture so that he turns. I create space so that he's able to free up. I connect my chest to his back. So rotational control can kind of work in a few ways. We can stop our opponent from moving at all. We can stop, we can move our opponent either direction. When we start looking at lever-based rotational control, we can kind of impart whatever movement we want to make sure we're in complete control. We can also close off one door and encourage our opponent to go through another door. And so that's what we're basically doing with the cross face. You can keep an underhook and you can get the cross face and you can hold them there. And you can absolutely just obliterate their posture and make life hell for them and then slowly work to climb into mount and just create that grueling pressure. Or in this case, we're crushing them so that they can't turn to face us. And so we're basically just giving them a complete red light to turn into us, but we're giving them a green light to turn away from us because with that rotational control, while I'm letting him move that way, I am letting him move that way. That's the only reason why he can't and so it's a trap essentially. I don't care if he turns away from me because that creates back exposure. I just don't want him to turn in. So that's just another way of utilizing rotational control. Cross face your opponent, let them turn away so that then you can start the series of back attacks that we've gone over so far. The next way we're gonna look at establishing lever-based rotational control to move our opponent is with the Kimura. This is our personal favorite at Island Top Team. Kimura is a very nuanced position and technique. I'm going to go over quickly just the basics of how to control it so you guys can move your opponent. But obviously there's a lot more information here to be able to chain really good things together. But I want to give you guys at least some food for thought and show you how the Kimura can work here. So once again, with levers, I'm all able to move my opponent. And so what we're looking at doing is we're going to be utilizing our opponent's near arm, which can be a very difficult arm to get in the scheme of things. So this is, can be done easier from north-south or attacking the forearm and moving over to it. But I'm controlling my opponent's wrist. When I'm first pinning the wrist, you can use a thumb grip, but the, uh, the C-clamp grip, where we're creating a C with our hand, is more for pushing. And so this is really strong for me to push my opponent's arm to his body so that if he tries to move it right now, it's difficult. However, I wanna to migrate to a monkey grip with no thumb there so that I'm gonna be able to create a stronger pulling force. So C's pull, monkey's pull. Seize push monkeys pull. So here, as I got this control, I'm going to migrate to the thumb. I'm going to bring this arm underneath here, connecting to the Kimura grip. So the same arm that would go underneath as if I was connecting to the seatbelt, it's here controlling. This arm comes underneath his elbow and no thumb grabs over top of my own wrist. And now what I want to do is I want to lock my arms out so that I'm able to cause internal rotation to my opponent's shoulder so you can see how his elbow flares away from his body, breaking his structure. What I wanna think about is punching his hand to his near hip. If Kevin's arm is close to his body like this, you can see how his elbow isn't far away from his body and so he can still be very strong here if I'm pushing to his far hip. However, if I pull the arm out like this, it starts to flare his elbow far away from his body, which makes him much weaker. From here, he's gonna be resisting, he's gonna be holding onto his belt, he might be clasping his hands together because he knows he doesn't wanna get Kimura or attacked with an arm bar. But as he's doing this, it's gonna create rigidity through his body that now, if I want to, I can turn him like away from me. I can obviously, if he turns away from me and I don't want that, I can pull and turn him back to me. But if he turns, if he's trying to stay, keep his back flat on the mat, keep your back on the mat, Kevin. Ooh. I've exposed the back and now I'm able to move to seatbelt connection and starting to move to a chair sit. We can do chair sits with the Kimura. We can just jump straight into attacking arm bars, but this is just kind of going over some basics of back attacks. Taking the back, 
And so controlling the wrist, pinning it to our opponent's body, getting our arm underneath through that inside space, no thumbs connecting to my wrist and to his wrists. Main thing is pressure at the elbow by extending my arm so that my bicep is locking out and pushing his arm here. So I'm not using too much force. I'm not doing this because I'm keeping my arms all super close to my body. There's times for this. If I feel like I'm gonna lose his elbow and I need to have my bicep check behind his elbow, then I'll do this, but I can't move him from here. Arms locked out means that I'm using bone to be able to support and generate this force and so that this is, I'm gonna be able to do this a lot longer. From here, trying to punch that to his far hip, his near hip as much as possible, and then I'm gonna to look to push his elbow away from me. And so I can even kind of lead with my head and chest here to rotate him. And then I start connecting to my seat belt. So just sort of a way of being thinking about how we can use a Kimura. I never use Kimuras to finish people. It's very difficult to finish high level guys with Kimuras. Don't see it very often at the black belt level. However, Kimuras are great to be able to chain a lot of different attacks together, to be able to gain control over our opponent and being able to take their back, being able to threaten with arm bars. It's a fantastic tool. And so I wanted to show you guys an example of how we can use it to create that back exposure to start our back taking sequences. Okay, we don't have a lot of options for taking the back from bottom at a basic level. There's obviously a lot of back takes we can do, but it becomes very complex and it's very difficult to do because we are in an inherently worse position by being on bottom, even if we are playing guard. However, the best tool that we can use that also translates to standing to kneeling is the arm drag. This is one of my favorite ways of engaging within the hand fight because there's no risk to doing it when you do it properly and by constantly threatening the arm drag even if you're not taking your opponent's back off of it you're creating big gaps of vulnerability within them uh within their, your opponent's alignment as they're responding to it and it's going to allow you to chain attack so much more effectively it's part of the grip fighting sequence for us at on the top team we're going to go over through it in like two parts because um Obviously, I want to be able to break this down quite thoroughly for you guys. So, we're going to just do this from butterfly guard. So, Kevin is going to be kneeling, and I'm going to be in a seated position. So, I have my legs at roughly a 90 degree angle of my hips, or 45 degree angle from the ground here, so that I have a little bit of extra movement to this outside and to the inside, so I'm kind of in the a halfway point. My elbows are going to be inside my knees, so I'm in a strong knee-elbow connection. I'm going to be keeping my shoulders forward to around my knee line, so that I'm going to be uh, with my weight forward, because if I lean too far back, Kevin's just going to push me back or access the lever. He also is going to potentially access the lever by just grabbing at my feet. So I want my shoulders at my knees, and I want my hands at my feet right here, so that if Kevin tries to grab at my feet right now, he's unable to. If I'm back here like this, and he grabs my feet, he's just going to dump me backwards. It's a little butterfly basics there. What I'm looking at doing is engaging my opponent's hands. This is always what we have to do. There's going to be a grip fight here. This is the engagement phase of guard. Whoever wins the engagement phase when we first make contact and start establishing grips wins and gets to move on to the next phase. What I'm going to do is I'm going to get a grip on my opponent's wrist here. And so this is basically moving into like this Aikido stuff with the wrist locks. We're not doing the wrist locks because this stuff just really doesn't work. But it's still strong lever control, so the grip itself is fine. I'm looking at having one of my fingers, it's typically my ring finger, is what I like, is going to be gripping closer down to the wrist here where it bends, so I'm helping increase the fulcrum, the pivot point, so that I'm able to actually bend his wrist. Meat of my palm and my thumb is connecting to the back of his hand here, and I'm taking my finger and I'm getting it in between the divots of his knuckles or in between his hands here. I'm gripping all the way over with my fingers here, gripping onto the meaty drumstick part of his thumb, so I've established control. This gives me a lever-based rotational control of his hand, so that I'm able to actually bend the wrist to affect structure. And so, rather than grabbing his wrist, where he can now keep it strong, I'm not at the end of the lever and I'll break that grip, it's really easy for him to deal with it. This is a better lever, and depending on how I get it, if I already get a bend in his wrist, not looking for wrist locks, but his ability to actually counter grip with this, very difficult. So very strong control. So just even getting good at this part here, where I can get that grip every time here. Just tracking my hands to his hands so I can get that control. Now, once I have this control, I can't hold it for that long. 
So what we're gonna to look to do is a movement of three different parts at the same time. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna punch my, his hand and my hand in towards his near hip. By doing it to the hip on the same side, just like I talked about with Kimura's, it's gonna naturally flare his elbow further away from his body. So if we turn here, if his hand is on this side, notice how his elbow is still really tight to his body. As I push the hand to this side, look how it flares away from his body. This is going to give me the ability to control and actually access that lever. Big problem that people do with the arm drag is that they just kind of reach back and they grab here without internally rotating their part and shoulder. And so Kevin's able to mirror this grip. We're basically just both in this rolling alignment. And I actually run the risk of if I'm trying to take Kevin's back and he redrags me, where I'm able to get my back taken. We don't ever want to have a 50-50 threat. By me internally rotating his shoulder and punching it into his hip, he now has no use of this arm. I want to do this at the same time as I take my leg out and as I punch my arm through. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to punch his arm into his body, I'm going to take this leg out and plant it in the base. By planting it into base, I've now made space that I'm going to be able to pull myself around his body while I pull him back and I'm going to be able to start inserting this as a hook. This arm fires through and controls down at the elbow. It doesn't honestly matter too much. Any of the real estate here of his tricep is gonna work, but the elbow is gonna give me greater lever control, and it's gonna allow me to further internally rotate his shoulder. So what I'm looking to do here is get this motion just like that. Here we're hand fighting, grip fighting. As I get this grip and I start to punch it in, I'm getting this grip to grab at the back of the elbow while I punch this in. So if he tries to move his arm right now, it's very difficult. Even if he reaches across with his other arm and he's trying to deal with this, I should be able to actually hold this grip for a bit. And it's good practice when you're doing this against, especially the lower level training partners. Can I get this control and just spam it for a little bit? Maybe even use it to sweep. But what we're gonna go over in the next video is now how are we gonna utilize this control to be able to drag our opponent's body across ours, across the center line, so we're gonna be able to take the back. But if you cannot initiate that first part where we have to first get the grip, and then we have the three part movement of punching the arm in, punching our arm across, grabbing back, so my right hand is reaching back to the back of his right elbow and tricep, while I take this leg out to clear it and be able to create base with my foot. If I can't do those three things at the same time, then I'm never gonna be able to make this work. So spend some time just drilling that part first. I usually, uh, when we're teaching in class, we will have them just work those movements of the arm drag first, and then in the next video, we'll work on how to complete the arm drag. Okay, so we've punched our opponent's arm in. How do we complete that arm drag? So as I'm here, I've got the grip on the hand, I'm punching it in, and I'm here. What I'm gonna do is I'm going to create a rowing motion, pulling my opponent's arm across my center line, so I'm able to take his back. If Kevin's arm is here, and I move to take his back, he's just gonna block me. He's always gonna hand fight me here and I'm never gonna be able to get around this arm. What I'm looking at doing is pulling this arm across my center line, the line basically that runs with my spine through the center of my body, so that there's nothing blocking me here. So I'm able to move to the back. So from here, I'm planting myself in base. I'm gonna create a rowing motion, generating base off of the ground and rowing my elbow into my body so that I can pull him across as I hip out. The goal is to move him as well as move myself. If I try and move him 100% of the direction, it's gonna take a lot of force. And if I move everything, if I try and move the entire distance myself, it's also not gonna be very efficient. If I can move him and move myself, I cover twice the ground, twice as fast. So here, I'm going to generate base and drive back as I pull. And as I pull, I'm gonna to work to turn my body and land on my elbow. So here, pulling across like this. I'm looking at landing on my elbow and I'm looking at bringing my knee up behind his butt as I bring myself down to his hips and reach over controlling his hips, closing my elbow to start establishing rotational control. Depending on how much I'm here, I might not even be on my elbow because I'm so much on my hip here. This leg is going to be hooking right around his knee here. Sometimes it will already be as a hook, that's gonna be the goal. But otherwise, I'm just right here and I'm bringing this knee in tight like this, so that if he tries to lift his leg out right now, 
I've got a little bit of a pinch on it with my legs. So if I'm just doing something like this and I'm super loose, he's gonna be able to just step his knee out or step his knee up and I've lost everything. So, we've got ourselves to this point. I'm now rowing, I'm gonna push, and as he starts to get to a point where I feel like he's crossed by me, I, I, I can't go too early right now because he hasn't crossed my center line. But as I row and his arm gets here, there's nothing he can do to stop me. I'm still holding onto his hand. Now I let go and I'm gonna start reaching to his hip as I finish hipping out a little bit to the side here and landing onto my elbow and bringing my knee in tight behind him like this. Now where have we landed? We have landed in attacking the turtle, but I have control of the hip here. I can grab his gi if I want to and close my elbow, otherwise grabbing at the hip. I'm gonna take this foot, I'm gonna grab right down here at his ankle with my leg, just like we did in the earlier video, where I'm now gonna use this ankle control to rotate his hip. I don't pull him on top of me. I already have this hook. I'm gonna hip out so that he falls into that empty space. So then I can put my other hook in, and now I can start immediately going into chokes. So we'll just give a few angles on this one. So here, we're in the hand fight, first video. Now I complete this pull, pulling him here. I'm looking at having him collapse onto his elbow. I'm bringing my chest and chin over top of his arm and his shoulder here, because what I don't want is space like this, and then he brings that arm back across my body. And this happens. I want to, at the very least, be here, so if he tries to bring this arm back up over my body, there. Even if it's not pretty, as he starts to try and turn into me, I'm able to start working on getting my seatbelt and attacking the turtle. His arm is just grabbing the bicep here, deep. I'm down on my elbow here, so as he tries to move this arm around, very difficult. Even if I'm not controlling it, my chest is so close to him, see how he can't get that elbow through? It's a wall. If he reaches all the way up over my head, I'll just have to make sure I move with that to stop him. From here, control it. I'm gonna to look to get that ankle control. Look to start pulling him back. I hip away so he falls into that space. And I start immediately going for the choke. Side. Go back, go back, go. Hand, got the control. Punch it into the hip. Pull across the body. One more time from the back side. So the arm drag is an excellent movement. So important to learn because even if you don't use the arm drag to take the back, it's gonna set up a ton of different options for you. It's part of your engagement phase when you're first getting into the grip fighting. If you can't win the grip fight, then you're never gonna make any of your other techniques work. So work on this, it's super important and it's gonna, you're gonna be able to take it with you in many different positions in Jiu Jitsu. Hey everyone, thank you so much for spending the time to go through this Gold BJJ Instructional with myself and Kevin. Kevin, thank you for generously donating your time. Thank you to Gold BJJ for this opportunity. And thank you to you guys for watching this. I just wanna leave you with one thought and it's just, just to make sure that you don't go complete tunnel vision when it comes to taking the back. The back is the best position we can get in fighting. Nothing wrong with going for it. It's the main goal that I strive for when I'm doing Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. However, if you tunnel vision, if you get tunnel vision and you focus on only that, you may miss other opportunities. A lot of, a lot of guys are gonna panic when you get close to taking their back and whether they're making bad movements or they're just gonna give other responses because literally anything is better than getting your back taken besides getting submitted. And so you're gonna get blocked sometimes and you might fail to take the back, but you might not see the other opportunities that lay in front of you. And so for example, say the arm drag super successful technique, not always easy to take the back, but it's always gonna create a very strong response from your opponent. So from here, the, one of the main ways people will block you from being able to take their back is that as I pull this arm across the center line, there's nothing stopping me from taking his back, so he posts his leg. Now his leg is gonna block me from being able to take his back. If I'm focused on just taking the back, I'm like, oh crap, I got nothing at this point. But if you go, no, I've broken his alignment, I've won a range battle, and while he's posted his leg and I can't take his back, this is gonna give me a lot of opportunity 
to now go to single leg X. And then I have a single leg X instructional, so now you go, okay, I, got, I know how to do single leg X stuff. And then you knock them down, and then you've also watched Dean Lister's leg lock instructional, so now you know how to finish the ankle lock or the heel hook. And so now these stuff, these instructionals start tying together in ways that you wouldn't otherwise piece together if you were just focusing on one thing. So drill, taking the back, practice controlling the back, but some of these things are going to lead to breaks in your opponent's alignment, breaks in their posture, their structure, or their base that's going to create vulnerability that's going to allow you to chain other positional movements, other transitions, other submissions, and you're going to be much more effective and diverse if you're able to see that and you're able to chain these things together. So I hope you guys find that useful and I hope you guys enjoy this instructional. Uh, hopefully I can do an entire instructional next on just attacking the turtle because that's a whole other game in itself. But if you guys have any questions, then let me know and I'll get back to you guys as soon as I can.